if there are any watching, take my hat off. I'm Larry Melichamp, a retired botanist from UNC Charlotte, where I taught for almost 40 years and was in charge of the botanical gardens out there. Some of y'all may have visited out there. Here I am dressed up as a uh, 18th century uh, botanist with my vasculum, which is a, a metal box that you put plants in to bring them home. And I am holding a little plant. So you can imagine my looking like this, uh, traipsing around the countryside. That's what would happen. Hold on just a second. You got this. You got this. I did do it. No, it's only on this one. Another example of what we should have done. You still hear me all right? Yes. All right. So this is a brief, very brief history of botanical exploration and discovery in the Carolinas, or certainly here in the Southeast, uh, during what we call the golden age of botany during the 18th century, the period of exploration, the, the age of exploration during the 1700s. You got to turn. Okay. Can you still hear me? We have an echo going on in here. I may just have to live with it. Okay. This talk is dedicated to an ancestor of mine, uh, a Dr. Joseph Mellishamp, who died in 1903. He lived down in Bluffton, South Carolina, which is the last little town down the coast. And he was a trained physician, a doctor, and an amateur botanist. And along with other uh, famous people of the time, the families, the Ravenels, the Porches, and others, was one of the well-known amateur botanists of South Carolina. There were a lot of botanists in South Carolina. They're part of the intellectual group out of Charleston during the 16, 17, 1800s. Dr. Mellishant was buried at a little church down there outside Bluffton. I've been to his grave site and there's a, a street name for him in Bluffton, South Carolina. Been there too. And he's especially famous for having discovered our native needle palm, which is a fabulous plant that it's, its northernmost locations are in and around Bluffton. And he's more famous for having studied uh, carnivorous pitcher plants, which live in the swamp, swamp lands, the pitcher plant bogs down there. So he studied the, the hooded pitcher plant in the late uh, 1800s. So imagine the world around 1492. This is certainly not a map of the world in 1492, but it puts you in the mood of thinking about the world back then, which was viewed as a little different than it is today. And, and we asked, where did Europe, civilized Europe, get its uh, exotic products? Here's a map a little more like 1492. This is actually labeled as being 1492, uh, probably a little bit after that, after Columbus. Columbus had to come back and tell what all was, was over there. So this map is a little more like that age. But here's a little more recognizable map. So during that period after 1490, before and immediately after 1492, European got most of his exotic products from the Far East. They came from China via the Silk Road overland with caravans, or they came from India via uh, the Persian region, Saudi Arabia and the Mideastern Persians. They were the middlemen. So, or they came by long boat voyage, usually by the Dutch coming from Southeast Asia around the Cape of Good Horn of Africa and up to Europe. So all of the products came from the Far East and all many of them came through the Persian area and exacted high prices 
So European was, was paying high prices for these exotic spices and silks and other products from the Far East. That was part of Columbus's impetus. So after Columbus, uh, the world changed. It was probably the most important change in the world, as far as we're concerned. After Columbus, there was more direct routes to the new world. Columbus was looking for a route to India. Of course, he ran into North America. <laughs> Uh, down here and uh, right here specifically is where Columbus first landed. So after Columbus, more and more products came from the New World, from the colonies and from other countries. So that's a little bit of background on where I'll be coming from here. Sugar cane, I'm going to talk a little bit about the earliest products uh, that were not native to North America, but were from the New World, just a little bit. So sugar cane was one of the first commodities to come out of the New World, not long after Columbus. One of the first things they took over to the tropical islands that Columbus discovered was sugar cane. And of course, it was uh, native labor and slave labor that worked the sugar cane. And the point of sugar cane was Europeans wanted the sugar, but, but even perhaps more, they wanted the rum made from molasses that was made from sugar cane. I think that's been the history of the world, is where do we get our alcohol? Uh, early, other early crops from the New World, tobacco, it didn't take long. It took, it took a, a while for the, for the, once the colonies were established, it wasn't long after 1607 that tobacco became a, a crop exported from the New World because everybody who came over here became addicted to tobacco. So they needed to have it to take back to Europe. Other famous early crops, uh, not from North America, but from Mexico was uh, cacao or cocoa or processed into chocolate. So chocolate became a, a great beverage along with coffee and tea uh, in Europe eventually as having come from the New World. So chocolate drink came from the New World. Coffee came from uh, Africa, and tea came from the Far East. So there are three caffeinated beverages, one from each uh, zone of the, of the, of the world. Uh, vanilla also came from the New World, from Mexico. It was used by the Aztecs to flavor the, the chocolate and make it palatable to drink. Because raw cocoa is pretty bitter. And so, uh, Vanilla is one of the great New World spices, along with allspice from Jamaica and chili peppers from Mexico. So those are the three New World spices, vanilla, allspice, and chili peppers. Then we move up into the Carolinas, a more temperate region. So after the colonies became established, they began growing these other famous crops. So they grew a corn, which would have been known as Indian corn, it was <laughs> colored corn, along with squashes and beans were the three New World crops. So these were native to North America. The other crops cultivated in the Carolinas, cotton, this came from Africa, and Carolina rice, um, possibly also came from Africa <laughs> or the Far East, and then uh, indigo. A very important plant that we don't think too much about today, but indigo was a very important crop of the early colonies because uh, Europeans couldn't get it very well anywhere else. So a little story about indigo. By 1689, indigo was being grown in Charleston by French Huguenot families. Here's the indigo plant. It made this beautiful blue dye that really was better than any other dye in the world. Uh, by 1760, or in 1760, A. Thomas Mellichamp received an award of a thousand pounds for perfecting an indio dye extraction process. This was very important because by 1776, some one million pounds of blue indigo dye uh, were shipped 
from Georgetown, South Carolina, back to, to England and Europe. So for a while, it was the main crop from the Carolinas was indigo dye. So if you're interested in, oh, by the way, here's our Queen Charlotte here and all of her radiant beauty. Uh, maybe the best thing about her was the beautiful blue dyes of her robes uh, from indigo. If you're interested in this, you should see the novel called uh, The Indigo Girl, uh, based on a real life uh, uh, person, Eliza Lucas Pinkney, who lived in Charleston in the 1700s, a young girl who inherited a plantation. And uh, to make a long story short, she made a go of growing uh, indigo during the late 1700s. Uh, Audrey has read this, I think twice, and recommends it highly uh, as a novel. Okay, next comes um, my discussion of some uh, useful native plants. Most of the plants we've been talking about, except corn, have come from somewhere else. They're not native to, to the actual uh, Carolinas. So we'll now talk about some native plants that are wild in the Carolinas. Remember, this was the age of discovery and collecting and finding new things in the Carolinas. Uh, trade with, with Europe, uh, animal skins that were unknown. Uh, they didn't have beaver in the old world. Uh, they didn't have some other things that, that were traded. And of course, they, Europeans brought guns to, to the American natives. One of the prime New World products uh, uh, was naval stores. This is um, tar, pitch, and turpentine. These three products used in uh, shipbuilding uh, came from our native longleaf pine. And throughout the Southeast, this was a very important crop. It was not as valuable pound for pound as tobacco or cotton or rum or indigo, but it was a very valuable crop. Here you see slaves working out in the longleaf pine plantations. They uh, cut into the pine trees collected the sap, uh, boiled it down to make turpentine, then burn uh, tree trunks and roots to extract the, the black uh, tar and pitch that was used uh, in shipbuilding. They plug the holes between the boards, make them waterproof, uh, super important. Then there were, of course, were the medicinal plants, which, which would be of greater interest to you folks. Uh, during the 17th and 18th centuries, knowledge of wild plants was just a, a boom uh, because in the old world, you had collections of, of medicinal plants, but the new world had a whole new crop, of, a whole new collection of medicinal plants learned from the American Indians. And these medicinal plants were, were widely known uh, back then. Today, they're little more than wildflowers uh, some of them for us. One of the very first crops or medicinal uh, commodities sent back from the New World was sassafras. This is a very uh, common tree uh, everywhere really in Eastern North America. It was the first product of the American colonies uh, 1578. It was brought back by Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, he was over here trying to establish a colony. Of course his colony failed that was the lost colony. At least he uh, discovered sassafras. And it was uh, very important as a uh, medicinal and flavoring plant, almost as important uh, just after tobacco. It used to treat many different diseases, not all of which did it really uh, cure, but, but they thought so. And so it was quite valuable. Here's uh, sassafras, for those of you interested, if you ever wanted to grow sassafras, it's beautiful fall color, but it forms a colony. This is one sassafras plant that has formed a colony or a clone over many, many years, and probably nothing much grows in there except the sassafras itself. It was the roots that we used, maybe the bark, especially the bark of the roots, and it made a sassafras tea and it was dried to make a concoction that might, probably had some medicinal properties, um, uh, but, but it, was, you know, it was not the magic that uh, they thought it was. We realize it's not 
quite that magical, but it still has active ingredients. Other plants that were highly sought after by Europeans were our, our trees. Europe had cut down most of their trees to make, to make ships over the centuries. So they were looking for new and better trees. So our white oak, majestic white oak, and sturdy red oak were two of the uh, tree crops that would have been taken back by seas and grown to replenish the forests of Europe. One of these trees was the tulip poplar. It was an early favorite. It had a straight trunk. It was easy, it was a re relatively soft wood, so it could be hollowed out for canoes. It was fast growing. You could cut it down, make a log house. You could cut it up into pieces to make shingles, and the roots were considered medicinal. There again, it wasn't a fabulous medicinal plant, but they believe that it, it worked. Here's the flower of the tulip poplar. There is a Chinese-related uh, species, but our American one seems to be the one uh, most highly regarded. Besides, during the colonial period, they didn't even know China and Japan existed, so they didn't have those trees. The tulip poplar was a little story about that. It was one of the trees that George Washington immediately planted after the Revolutionary War. As the story goes, he got rid of all his European plants, his English hollies and yews and boxwoods and all the other things that, that were English and started planting American plants, a white pine, our native oaks, and especially tulip poplars. So here's Mount Vernon with its tulip poplars. The same thing happened with Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. Uh, he planted these two famous tulip poplars. He planted about 1800. Uh, they're still there, along with other trees that he planted. If you ever go to Monticello, celebrate the 200 year old trees. And even today, if you had a little, a little cottage up in the mountains of North Carolina, you, know, you might plant tulip poplars to be in scale with your, with your cottage. These are tulip poplars, a double row of them out in front of Biltmore House. Uh, Biltmore House was completed in 1895, so these would have been planted then. And these are new ones that were replaced about 20 years ago. They cut down the 100-year-old trees that were beginning to age out and planted new uh, tulip poplars there. So it's a very famous plant. Uh, do not plant one in your small yard. They get way too big for a normal home. But if your home is big enough, then they'll fit in in your, in your front lawn. So also during this period, the herbal plants of the Carolinas backcountry, this is, this is where you all come in. You all are, are backcountry uh, folk. And the backcountry was the frontier in the late 1700s. So here's a little map. This map is out of uh, K. Moss and Suzanne Simmons' newest book, uh, Curious Garden of Herbs. This shows the backcountry. And so here we are right there, I guess, in Charlotte. And uh, her book enumerates many, many plants that would have been brought over from the old world, uh, grown in gardens. And some native plants would have been also uh, commonly used. Uh, now, she uses one example, the sassafras. She shows this, this uh, the ladies show this sassafras picture in their book because it was so important. And back during the 1700s, uh, and you all are more well of this than I am, uh, folks used a lot of the books of the day, uh, herbals, catalogs, encyclopedias, list of plants, to find out what things might have been useful. So this picture came out of a, I don't know if you can read it, but a, a late 1700s uh, uh, book of herbal plants from the world. So I just, I went through uh, K. Moss and Suzanne Simmons' book and just picked out all of the native plants of the Carolinas that she lists that were used as herbal remedies. And as you go down this list, there's quite a few. Uh, violets, here's the show, lamb's quarters, bee balm, certain plantains, pokeweed, very important as we'll see, yarrow, crabapple, dogwood, 
persimmon, red bud, sassafras, sumac, sweet shrub, and of course the nut trees, hickory, chestnut, black walnut, and especially muscadine grapes and some of the other grapes they tried to make wine out of. And as time went on, other plants were discovered from farther west, like pecan, which comes from Texas. So this is a pretty good collection of new plants from the New World uh, discovered by the colonists that took their place in the annals of history as useful herbal remedies. Some of which uh, today you wouldn't consider them herbal remedies, but they did back then. Uh, wildflowers from the colonial area uh, are reminding you again that many of the plants today that we consider ornamental wildflowers for a little wildflower garden were used by Native Americans for their medicinal value. And the colonists adopted uh, many of these uh, wild plants and used them, but they may not have grown them in their herb gardens. They may have just gone out and collected them as they needed to from the wild. I imagine there were both men and especially women who uh, you can just see a, a, a backcountry housewife telling her husband, go out in the woods and collect me some bloodroot. I need to put some on Johnny's sore on his leg. Uh, you know, so these things would be acquired as needed. So now you don't have to read all this. Don't be scared. This is just, I'm just gonna mention just a few, just four really of our native wildflowers that were very famous and still are today as herbal remedies that actually did cure things. Uh, Bloodroot was used by Americans and Europeans. Bloodroot is <coughs> nowhere else other than um, Eastern North America. Uh, ginseng uh, does have a Chinese counterpart. But our American ginseng was uh, highly valuable for its um, overall uh, tonic as, uh, as a booster of mental energy and physical functioning. And it was a plant always highly valuable. I, I believe uh, Daniel Boone made extra money by collecting ginseng uh, back in his day. Uh, golden seal, we'll, we'll see a uh, very important uh, plant even today uh, to cure illnesses and, and may apple. Th these all have active ingredients in them that have effect on the human body. That uh, many of them have been replaced by synthetic drugs, but in some cases the wild plants are still used. Here's bloodroot. Bloodroot is an early uh, harbinger of spring, if you will, easy to grow. If you, if you wanted any native plant to grow in your home garden, bloodroot would be one of the easiest ones to grow if you have a little shady place. Uh, bloodroot with its red sap. Red sap was used to treat skin cancers and face paint and other things. And of course, you can buy it as an extract. It's been used in toothpaste. It has an antibacterial uh, action, uh, but it's not a mainstream plant. But it's you know, it's a useful plant. Uh, ginseng, the most famous of all time, I suppose. You know, the ginseng plant grows in almost every county east of the Mississippi from north to south. A very distinctive pattern of leaves. Each leaf is kind of wide and fat like this. And it's usually recognized in the fall when the berries turn red. And it's its roots that are the edible part. If you're a, a sang collector, you go out in the fall looking for the red berries you dig up the plant, take the root, and drop the berries back in the hole so that you sort of replant your, your valuable crop. And that's how it perpetuates. And good sang hunters uh, always do that. They don't want to uh, over uh, collect. So they always replant the seed. So here's some folks. A lot of people who make a lot of money collecting and growing ginseng. So here's some folks who, with some of their ginseng plants. And I guess ginseng is um, considered valuable because each root looks like a little person. It can have legs and arms and a head. And folks thought that because it looked like a little person, it must be really good for curing the whole body. So that's why ginseng is so valuable. 
It doesn't really, it's not magical, but some people think it is. Here's the whole plant, there's the roots. It takes several years to grow a, a big root like this. So these would be very valuable. Each of these plants might fetch $100 uh, fresh. Uh, golden seal, uh, I love this plant, have a whole backyard full of it. If anybody wants some. Uh, the flowers last two or three days only. Uh, they're cute when they come up. The leaves get large like a dinner plate, fill in, look good in the summertime. It has a little red berry on it. But the medicinal part is the roots. The roots have this bright yellow color. And as is often the case throughout the world, plants with brightly colored saps are often considered medicinal. Um, at the same time, they might be considered poisons. So the difference between a poison and a medicine is what? Dose, how much do you take? This little bit will cure you, this little bit more might kill you. So you have to know just how much to take. You can buy ginseng, I mean, uh, you can buy golden seal as a, a powder in almost any health food store today. One of my favorite uh, wildflowers that everybody seems to like is mayapple. So many folks grew up near a creek or a stream or a bottom land where may mayapple grows abundantly. Uh, this is a turtle's eye view of mayapple flower. They grow underneath the leaves and there's one big flower there. So people like mayapple. It forms a colony. Here's mayapple growing down in a floodplain. And here's one of the plants. In late summer, it makes its fruit, called an apple, mayapple. That's the only part of the plant that's edible in an everyday sense. You can collect those when they turn ripe and make pies or, or other things with them. They're kind of fruity. But you want to be careful how you, how you eat the other parts of the plant. This is the underground root that grows. And this would have been the part that would be collected and it would be dried and mixed. This is a, this pile of trash here is a, uh, is a, uh, a, a, a prescription. It's a mixture of dried roots and bark. And I do not know what it really represents, but there's the mayapple root in there. And this would be boiled probably to make a, a, a tincture or it might be soaked. I don't know, I don't know all the different ways it might've been used, but. Here's an old a product package uh, of uh, where Mayapple is sold uh, for various and sundry things that it helps you with. But dosage is all the uh, is all the important, and as a cathartic would have been the thing. Uh, a lot of these plants are almost poisonous if you use this uh, laxatives and cathartics. I wouldn't take them, but I guess people did when they didn't have anything else. Also, our common uh, plants, some of our wildflowers, they got their names based on the so-called doctrine of signatures, uh, which uh, is an, uh, you know, an, an ancient belief that the uh, God put every plant here with a medicinal use, and he gave clues as to what the use was by looking at some part of the plant. So this little plant here called hepatica or liverwort, the lobed blotched leaves looked like a human liver. And so it was used for liver ailments. The toothwort in the mustard family has toothed leaves. So it must be good for teeth ailments. And the bleeding heart, where the flower is shaped like a heart, must be good for heart ailments. None of those cures has shown to be true, but still, People use them. And two things. The worst thing is they didn't kill you. You used them in small quantities, so they didn't kill you. And probably, in my opinion, based on, based on nothing other than my opinion, is that taking some of these wild plants at least gave you uh, vitamins and, and minerals that you might be missing in your diet. So a little bit of these things uh, could have been the difference between good health and poor health some of the early colonists who didn't have one-a-day vitamins and, and uh, supplements and things you could take if you were having um, problems. So I, I think they were a good thing. Here's some other uh, 
wildflowers that had medicinal names before they had uh, what we consider their wildflower names, they were medicinal. So pleurisy root, uh, we now call it orange butterfly weed. Uh, nobody calls this pleurisy root, but it was used for uh, ailments that having to do with uh, uh, the, uh, the bodily cavities, uh, uh, like a uh, lung, like if your lungs were filling with fluid, you might take a concoction of this. We now know it as the plant for monarch butterflies. Kidney root. Who, who uses Joe Pye Reed for kidney ailments? Probably nobody. So you call it Joe Pye Reed. Uh, Joe Pye was a famous Indian physician. And the use of the word weed, you know, weed is, should not be viewed as a four letter word. Uh, weed is, a, is an okay word thing. Back then they called weeds, uh, little wild plants were weeds. They were not what we might today call vicious weeds like you pull out of the flower bed. That weed didn't have the connotation back then that it does today. Uh, Oswego tea, we now call bee balm. Very few people make tea out of it, although they certainly could, but it was very important back then. One of the most important true weeds, a weed is a plant that grows in disturbed areas. Okay, so that's the definition of a weed. So pokeberry or pokeweed, a very common plant here in Eastern North America. And uh, this plant does not grow anywhere other than Eastern North America. And it was very important as an early spring herb. It, it came up just as soon as uh, the frost be became less uh, severe. So it was the first fresh green thing that the uh, colonists could go out and dig up and make into, they could cook it, maybe one or two changes of water, uh, uh, cook it to make a uh, poke salad or uh, I guess sort of like spinach uh, where it poke greens. Uh, it was very important nutritionally as a fresh spring green or late winter green. And as it grows, it grows into a tall rank plant, four, five, six, seven, eight feet tall. Uh, by then you didn't bother with it because the, you were afraid of the red um, color that was considered poisonous. It's, it's not as poisonous as you think, but it's bad enough. It's the root that'll kill you. That's why you don't eat the root. These berries ripen into a beautiful purple berries. They're really, they're really kind of attractive as a garden plant if you, if you uh, compared it with some other plants. But because it's viewed as a roadside weed, nobody wants it in their garden. And I believe the story that the juice of the ripe poke berries made an ink and that that ink. That's right. Used to I used it. Find the uh, right, right the Declaration of Independence. So, so I believe that. <laughs> so um, we should give a little more respect to Pokeweed as a, as a, as what it meant to the colonists and the backcountry housewives and, okay. and society as a whole. Uh, just yeah, I heard very okay. good, Hazel. I'd like to see something written in Pokeweed <laughs> juice. <laughs> Uh, other important natives, remember these are native plants of North America. These did not come over from Europe. These were found here. The folks didn't have these plants until the new world was discovered. So this is Jerusalem artichoke, one of our larger wildflowers. See how big that is. And it's, you might think this fence is gonna keep it in check, but it's not. It grows very ravenously underground, produces these tubers that we call a Jerusalem artichoke. They're very nutritious. And uh, I've seen a uh, Jerusalem artichoke growing right here in Mecklenburg County, although it's getting more difficult to find it because of development. Uh, blueberries and cranberries are New World plants. They don't grow in anywhere else in the world, but, but North America. And the early colonists would have found them in the mountains of North Carolina, the cranberry bogs up there. And then of course the, uh, uh, the common blue violets. Uh, violets definitely grow in the old world. But there are a whole lot more in the new world. And this little violet, uh, while not fragrant, uh, was certainly edible and was widely used for a number of uh, both the leaves and the flowers, as we'll see. So in part four, here's some native plants of the colonies of scientific and ornamental value. We've been talking about their medicinal and food properties. So here's some uh, off into another realm, scientific and ornamentals. 
back in the late 1600s and 1700s, into the 1700s, Europeans, especially the English, sent plant collectors to the New World to collect new and unusual specimens. There are also people who came here looking for birds and rocks and shells and every other kind of curiosity. And, and back in Europe, people had what were called cabinets of curiosities. And this would be a collection of artifacts uh, accumulated from all over the world. And, and wealthy people would pay collectors. You know, you might get a hundred pounds from each of 15 people. And this would be enough to send you off on a one month collecting trip somewhere. And that person would collect anything and everything and bring it back. And they would give representative specimens to their, to their patrons to help sponsor the trip. And so there would be plants and, and uh, there would be insects and minerals. And this is coral and, and paintings and just all kinds of things. These cabinets of curiosities from around the world. This is a kind of a modern collection. It's not really in a cabinet. Uh, by the way, these cabinets could almost be rooms, whole rooms, like, like you might have a hunter have a room of trophy heads of animals he had uh, shot. Uh, folks who didn't do that would have rooms full of artifacts around the world, plants, animals, minerals, shells. So here's a modern collection of artifacts. Here's some pressed, these are actual fern specimens. Uh, the leaves are pressed and framed. Here are other pieces of plants, uh, cones, fruits, berries, all kinds of things that when they were fresh were fairly attractive. And uh, people brag about these. I mean, these were important objects back then, uh, things from nature. Uh, here's a, I love this picture from the 1750s, a group of learned men of their day. This could have been in the 1650s hundreds who um, um, had gathered together. This is at a famous botanical garden, the Chelsea Physic Garden that I'll mention in a minute. They would get together occasionally to talk about the new plants that had been discovered. This was the uh, loyal society of apothecaries who were druggists and doctors who needed to know about plants for curing. They would get together. I do not know if women had their own groups probably did, maybe not quite as, uh, they were not professional um, um, druggists, but I'm sure they enjoyed uh, these new plants in their own way. For example, the Chelsea Physic Garden, one of the oldest botanical gardens in the world, founded in 1673. Uh, this is a, a period in London and also in, in European cities where learned, uh, men got together of all uh, disciplines, math, math uh, botany, uh, animal science, doctors, uh, lawyers, whatnot, people who mostly spoke Latin to each other. Uh, the, the Chelsea Physic Garden was begun. It's a four-acre garden. Uh, you can visit it today. It's on the uh, southwest edge of London. This is where all the new plants were being grown, that were being brought in from all travels around the world to be grown and studied. Uh, they were especially looked at for their medicinal value, but it didn't take long for them to be recognized as having ornamental value. And this garden was, had a patron. Their patron was Sir Hans Sloan. And there's a statue of him in the middle of the garden. And he sort of uh, looked out over the realm and I saw the same situation when I went to China in uh, the town of Wuhan, where I went. And in the botanical gardens, there was a medicinal garden and a big statue of, of a famous uh, Chinese doctor of three or four hundred years ago, who sort of considered the patron saint of, of doctors. So here's Hans Sloan. These plants here are actually North American uh, carnivorous pitcher plants on display. So they had plants from all over the world. They would have had our native dogwood and redbud and other plants that were new to science at the time being brought back and displayed. Very important. So here's some of these native trees, dogwood, redbud. These, these were thought to have some medicinal 
properties, that were, but they were more ornamental than medicinal. In this case, uh, redbud was well known. Uh, the flowers were edible to put in salads. See the, see the redbud flowers and also uh, the common blue violet here. Uh, this is a salad. That I, I think Audrey made this three or five years ago. And I went out and collected the, the redbud and the violets and there's eggs and lettuce and other goodies. Uh, wild asparagus up here. So these things were very popular back then. We don't, I mean, how many people do you know that put red bud flowers in salads? But we ought to bring that back, that practice. Uh, along this same time, late 1600s into the 1700s, the other botanical gardens around Europe, uh, a big botanical garden in Paris, the Royal Botanical Gardens in Paris, also receiving plants from the New World. And here's this famous tree there. It's considered the oldest tree in Paris. It's a black locust. It's from North America. And so my point here, American plants, for various reasons, medicinal, edible, ornamental, scientific, are highly regarded in the, uh, among the uh, educated folks of England and Europe and their botanical gardens reflected this and then growing them and studying them and enjoying them. So the Carolinas, they were botanically unique. You can't separate North and South Carolina. There's no natural boundary. Here's the Savannah River that separates Georgia and the soil types change when you go into Virginia. But the Carolinas were considered a, a, a unit and they were part of the uh, Lord's proprietors uh, grants that uh, the king gave to uh, his wealthy supporters uh, back in the 1600s. And so uh, here, this was Virginia. It, it started on the coast and went well inland. <laughs> Same thing with North Carolina. These little blocks of land given to the, I think there were about 60 Lord proprietors who received this land. Here's South Carolina, here's Georgia, down here would be Florida, north of there would be Canada. So between 1663 and on into the 1700s, these were the, the regions of the New World as seen by Europeans. You're either from Canada, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, or Florida. That's all they knew in the early days. And there were famous travelers who, who came through this region. Of course, Charleston would have been the great southern city, uh, port where, where so many Europeans came. Uh, its counterpart would have been Philadelphia in the north, the, the seat of government and learned societies and uh, folks who got together to talk about the issues of the day. So I'm gonna mention these six people. Uh, John Lawson sort of started out the century. Uh, uh, he was an explorer. Uh, Mark Catesby was a painter. Uh, Carl Linnaeus was a botanist. The Bartrams were horticulturists. Andre Michaud was probably the most famous botanist who ever came to the New World. And we end the century with, with Lewis and Clark. So John Lawson, his famous book, uh, uh, a, a New Voyage to Carolina. This is the title. A New Voyage to Carolina, containing the exact description and natural history of that country, together with the uh, present state thereof in a journal of, I, I, this is the title, that's a long title, by John Lawson, who was a, a surveyor. And this was published in 1709, uh, just before his death. So here's his route from Charleston up through South Carolina, North Carolina, and he was killed by Native Indians up here. And his purpose was to describe the countryside and try to encourage European settlers to come over. And he was like a land agent. He was a real estate agent. So his book was like a, a pamphlet to encourage uh, people. And he said he gave a lengthy account of, of the plants and animals, like chestnut, oaks, hickories, pines, gums, berries, cherries. It was a great place to grow peaches, apples, quince, pears. He was trying to make this place look like the Garden of Eden. And so uh, he showed some of the uh, plants and animals of, of the Carolinas. 
So he was the first to uh, publish accounts of this, of this region uh, for the purpose of showing it off, I guess, or, or explaining it. In 1712, a young English guy, here's a, a modern day portrayer of Mark Catesby. To me, as a botanist, he, he was our first great uh, person who really made impact. He, he came over during these, during these 20 years to Charleston. He traveled out from there. He spent time in Virginia and the Carolinas, and he uh, collected and painted uh, portraits of native plants in America, the first ones, first one. He was the first realistic artist. And he didn't always get everything right. He put plants and animals in the same picture, as we'll see. And, and he didn't always put the right animal and the right plant, but he did a great job of portraying them. And then he went back home and made his own etching, his own copper etchings, and published uh, books and sold them to make a living. And it was very famous in his day. And his book was was called. Um, it was a. Uh, 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 it was a. Uh, 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 plants and animals of the, of the Carolinas, Georgia, and the Caribbean. So this was his realm uh, where, he, where he traveled. And everything he found was uh, practically new science. Here's some of his paintings. Uh, we, we, con considering what came before him, these were very realistic, even though we would view them today as somewhat crude, as the scarlet ibis. Here's our ruby-throated hummingbird on a trumpet vine. Here's a, a couple of librarians showing off. This is one of Catesby's original editions that he that he put. These would be a priceless books today. Um, antiquarian booksellers might get hold of one of these uh, books and it would tear out or cut out the plates. Of the, of the paintings, you sell them for a thousand dollars. I tried to buy a, a, a actual plate once about 25 years ago, but there were, I would have had to have uh, mortgaged the car and the house uh, and just didn't have any pictures that I wanted. All the good ones had been sold. This is at an antiquarian bookstore up in uh, Philadelphia, uh, north, just northwest of the city of Philadelphia. So if you got money, you can you can get these plates. So here's a ivory bill woodpecker on a willow oak. These of course are extinct now. So a lot of the uh, birds that he saw, like the Carolina parakeet, this became extinct by uh, 1900. And so uh, you know he he saw plant uh, plants and animals, mostly animals. I don't think any of his plants have gone extinct except one. Uh, uh, so Carolina parakeet, which was very common back then. And here's a, a picture of a, a this, this is a giant book, as, as, as we saw. And there's there would have been the, the etching, hand-colored etching. And over here in English and French, he described uh, the, the plants and animals that he, that he painted. And this was a big hit back then in England and Europe. He uh, painted, my favorite, of course, being a botanist who studied pitcher plants during my career. Here's his plate of two species of pitcher plants with a toad and a click beetle. These two animals have nothing to do with these pitcher plants. This is an example of how he mixed things on the same plate. It didn't really have anything to do with each other, but there they were. Uh, this, these were the previous pit pictures of pitcher plants, rather crude. Not bad, but still rather crude compared to his. He was considered a great realistic uh, painter of his day. So here are his pictures of pitcher plants, and here's a real pitcher plant. And, and you can tell pretty good how big it was. And with the hood here and the pit, pitcher plants have hollow leaves that catch insects, and they often have, have red veins. And so he captured that pretty well. And he, and he wrote about them. He, his book was a natural history of the Carolinas, uh, uh, Georgia, the Florida, and the Bahamas. And so, because I've studied pitcher plants, I can talk more about them than other kinds of plants. Pitcher plants attract flies and other insects, and they fall down into the tubes. 
and they're digested. So here's a tube cut open at the end of the growing season, and there are the dead insects down there. And this was not known in Catesby's day. Uh, I mean, these are pictures I took. My, Catesby never painted this. He never knew that pitcher plants ate uh, insects. In fact, there's more, his little uh, tree frog sometimes seen in pitcher plants. Uh, Catesby wrote in his book that pitcher plants were created by God as a haven uh, for frogs and other insects to, to seek refuge from the heat. Uh, I'm sure he experienced the heat of the Southeast. Um, and it wasn't until uh, 1885 when my ancestor, Joseph Mellishamp, studied pitcher plants that it became known that they were actually carnivorous, that they actually caught and digested insects. So we've learned a lot over the centuries. In the middle of the century, a Carl Linnaeus, the famous Swedish botanist, uh, had published his famous book, Species Plantera, which means species of plants, where he had enumerated the known 10,000 plants that were known in his day. He thought he had a pretty good selection of the world's plants. <laughs> Turns out there's more like 400,000 than just 10,000 but he was the first one to compile the names into books. And he was famous for inventing the two-part scientific name in, in his book, like the genus name plus the species epithet gives you a two-part scientific name. So the flowering dogwood here, its Latin name is Cornus Florida, two-part name. Cornus means dogwood and Florida means flowering. And that became its name based on the fact that it was published in Linnaeus' book. He, he published the names of 10,000 plants and animals of his day, which was, was the beginning of our scientific nomenclature. So that's why he was famous. One of his students, Peter Kalm, came to America. He wrote a, a travelogue, which you can read. I think, I think Audrey has read, uh, has a copy of this, a part of his writings. And as is often the case in the old days, when people traveled, not only did they talk about what they went there for, but they recorded folklore, uh, what people did, farm life, uh, ways of life, and all kinds of other curiosities uh, uh, that they saw. And that makes their writings very valuable. Peter Kahl's most famous discovery was the mountain laurel, which Linnaeus named after him, Calmia or Calmia. Uh, we wouldn't say Calmia, we'd say Calmia. Latin name, Calmia latifolia. One of our most unique plants, it grows nowhere else in the world, except uh, Eastern North America, and especially up in the mountains. And here's its uh, beautiful closest of its flower. And it's unique in that it's stamens, it has 10 stamens, and each stamen is bent over like a, set like a mouse trap. Uh, stuck down in little notches in the petals so that when the bee visits the flower to get nectar, she trips over these stamens and shakes pollen on her back. So here's a little video of questionable quality that Audrey and I made. Here we are tripping the stamens in the calmia flower. You can see each one springs over like a mouse trap. He shakes pollen onto the bees. So this is a great thing for you to do with children, your, your grandchildren, or even your grown children, even yourself. If you've never played with a Mount Laurel flower, uh, you need to do that this spring, see how they trip. One of the world's great plants came from the Carolinas. We also uh, have more native azaleas, native wild azaleas in the Carolinas than anywhere else in uh, Eastern North America. Uh, there's 16 species in the Southeast. Uh, not all of them occur in the Carolinas, but the majority. This is our pinkster bloom, azalea that blooms in April. And here's a very famous uh, flame azalea that uh, are known as uh, the mountains. It became world famous uh, when it was discovered and taken to, to Europe. And these wild azaleas, here you see yellow ones and white ones, and pink ones. Those are the three main colors, uh, easily grown in a home garden, uh, woodland setting. Uh, they bloom beautifully. And like I say, there's 16 species in the Southeast. 
all easily grown. Uh, very few of these occur elsewhere in the world. There's a handful, but the great majority are in the southeastern United States. Another unique plant to our region in the east, sourwood, or lily of the valley tree. Here's the flower, they look just like lily of the valley. They're in the, uh, this is in the Heath family. Uh, lily of the valley is in the lily family. But here's the tree. And they're very prominent up in the mountains. And in June, when they bloom, the bees uh, love them, the honeybees, and so they make uh, sourwood honey. So that's one of the great products unique to Eastern North America and is, uh, has the same value as um, maple syrup or maple, uh, uh, maple sugar, but especially maple syrup. Uh, you could trade these quart for quart for maple syrup. Uh, middle of the, of the colonial period were the Bartrams. John Bartram, uh, the father, born around 1700, and then his son, William Bartram, who spanned the rest of the century. These were, you cannot uh, overstate the, the significance of, of the Bartrams. Uh, they were unique in that they traveled through the South. They collected wild plants. They had a nursery, if you will, in Philadelphia. They sold plants. They sent uh, plants to Europe. That's how they made a living. Uh, William Bartram wrote a famous book called Travels Throughout the South, published in 1791. And so the father, John, and the son, William, collected sent seeds uh, to Europe. And in uh, 1765, they discovered the, the Franklinia tree, what they call the Ben Franklin tree. They named it after Benjamin Franklin. They discovered this tree in Northeast Georgia. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Uh, they collected it for about 20 years. They collected seeds and brought them into cultivation. They grew very well. By 1803, the tree was extinct. Either over collected or we believe a disease uh, killed it. It is still widely grown today, but it's one example of an extinct plant in Eastern North America that's still grown only in gardens today. Um, the Bartrams were so famous that they advised George Washington. There's George, and there's John Bartram, and there's Benjamin Franklin. And uh, this is at the, uh, John Bartram's home and a botanical garden in uh, the south side of Philadelphia. And so I'm sure uh, 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 John helped George get his tulip poplars uh, to plant around his house after the Revolutionary War. Here's the Ben Franklin tree that the Bartrams made famous that they discovered in Georgia that, that went extinct. They named it after Benjamin Franklin. Franklinia Alatamaha, that's the name of the river down in North, Northeast Georgia where they found it. It's truly one of our great American treasures that grown around the world. Uh, William Bartram was a, he was a son. He was a, a pretty good artist. So he painted uh, various versions of of Franklin, and as was uh, often done in that day, they usually had a little study of seed pods and seeds and close-up things that, that you wouldn't naturally put, wouldn't normally put in a picture. But he was had his botanical side, so he did that. Uh, the flame azalea I mentioned here because it was John Bartram who traveled up into the mountains of the Carolinas. And upon seeing the azaleas on the mountainside, here you can see flame azaleas growing throughout the mountainside. He said the mountains were aflame like fire from the orange azaleas. That's how they got the name flame azalea from John Bartram. Other unique plants to the Carolinas, their curiosities. Uh, you, you wouldn't eat these. They might eat you. You wouldn't eat these. This is the famous Venus flytrap, which uh, grows only in eastern North Carolina and adjacent South Carolina within about an 80 mile radius of Wilmington. And young William Bartram was sent to collect the first ones uh, in around 1760. 
near Wilmington. He found the first Venus fly traps in places that we stomp around now. Back in his day, it was all wilderness. He published the first illustration. So down here in this uh, paint picture that he drew, published, of Lotus, the Venus flytrap stuck down in the corner. A fairly accurate view of that, 1760. So I, I used to view the 1700s as kind of the dark ages of, of, of American history. And it didn't take me long as, a, as my botanical knowledge increased to now view the 1700s as the, the golden age instead of the dark ages, it was the golden age of botanical discovery and making things known to the world uh, and um, botanical art and writing. Oh, and there are two other uh, species of plants named after presidents, o only two of, out of all the presidents. I don't know why, but only two plants got named after presidents. Um, twin leaf, a little wildflower I'll show you, named after Jefferson, Jeffersonia, and then a California desert palm named after George Washington. So here's Jeffersonia, twin leaf, uh, growing in our front yard. Here's its twin leaf, looks like butterfly wings. The flower lasts about two days if it doesn't rain. <laughs> but it makes a cute little seed pod, and seeds come out in the end. So that was named after Thomas Jefferson. And then uh, here's the California desert palm, a uh, majestic plant that grows in the mountains of uh, California and, and around Palm Springs and over in adjacent Arizona, named after George Washington, Washingtonia filifera. So when President Washington was in Charlotte a few years ago, uh, Audrey spoke to them about this issue. And she asked him what he thought of having a California plant named after him. And he was uh, well known as an Eastern uh, Virginia uh, person. He said he thought that was okay. It was a majestic plant. He thought it was worth uh, bearing his name. And so he, he thought that was okay. So, so. Um, I don't let that bother you that the, the, this plant was so far to the west. Uh, the last famous person was Andre Michaud. He came over in 1786. He was sent by the French government to collect trees and other plants, bring back to, to Europe. And he collected, he discovered more plants than any other botanist then or, or since. Over 250 new plants he discovered in the late Seven, the last 20 years of the, of the decade. Uh, his most uh, famous plant he found uh, was Oconee Bells, a little plant that grows up in the, uh, the mountains of upstate South Carolina and adjacent North Carolina. He collected these in 1788, sent dried specimens back to uh, Paris and um, wrote about them in his journals and then pretty much forgotten about them. And in, in 1840, 18, I must say 50 years later, his dried plant specimens were discovered and people want to know what they were. And so botanists began trying to find them. And they weren't found again until 100 years later, uh, around 1877. Here's the plant, Oconee Bells, uh, a small plant with shiny evergreen leaves, it grows in the low mountains under rhododendrons in about six counties in uh, Western, uh, North and South Carolina. And it has beautiful uh, late winter flowers that blooms in March. So I'll read you this little synopsis. The story of this legendary plant abounds with ironies. Uh, Shortia or Oconee Bells was discovered by a man who didn't name it. That would have been the show. Named for a man who never saw it that would be Dr. Short, by someone who didn't know where to locate it and was rediscovered by a young man who didn't know what it was 100 years later. So it is one of the most um, um, uh, mysteri my mysterious isn't the right word, but enigmatic plants ever discovered in, in uh, Eastern North America, <laughs> world famous. Here's, here, here it is growing on the banks of a creek under rhododendrons. Uh, it forms a little evergreen ground cover. And uh, it's difficult to grow here in Charlotte. It doesn't like our uh, heat and 
dry. Uh, it grows up where, where it gets twice the rainfall as we get here. And it's, it's possible to grow it here, but not easy. And uh, the last of the uh, famous plants that Michaud found was big leaf magnolia. He found it in Lincoln County, North Carolina, over near Spencer Mountain. There's a, a bird's eye view of Spencer Mountain. So every time you drive by Spencer Mountain on I-85, which is over here, think about big leaf magnolia. You can see some of the uh, plants in the uh, woods down here. Um, there's one right there. And there's another one over here. So think about those, even though you may not be able to see them. Here's the leaf. The leaf is up to 40 inches long. And the flower is bigger than a dinner plate. It has the largest uh, leaf of any plant in the world outside the tropics. Now, in the tropics, you get really big leaves. But um, uh, other than palms, which don't really count, because their leaves are highly divided, this is the largest um, simple undivided leaf in the world. And it's uh, world famous. In the fall, it turns a, eh, a moderate, moderate, moderate fall color. It has these cones of beautiful orange seeds that birds love. And here's a plant out in the gardens at UNC Charlotte. We have lots of them out there. They, they come up everywhere because this is their native habitat. They're found only in the four uh, five counties just west of the Catawba River, York, Gaston, Lincoln, Catawba, and Arden. And uh, Michaud found them in Lincoln County. And uh, in the fall, you can, uh, the leaves are fun to go out and pick up. They're too big to rake. You have to gather them if you want to remove them from your yard. They're fun to bring inside, fun to play with. Big leaf magnolia. World famous plant, originally from the Carolinas. You can see a lot of these plants out at the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens. And finally, to end the century, I point out that attentions began to turn. Uh, Lewis and Clark headed west. People thought they knew everything about the East by 1800. And so uh, President Jefferson wanted to know more about the West. So he sent Lewis and Clark. And of course, they discovered many things. Um, one of the first plants they sent back, and the only one of theirs plants I'm going to mention, was the Osage orange. It does not grow naturally east of the Mississippi. And they found it almost the next day when they left St. Louis heading west. And these big fruits, the size of grapefruits, um, are, are not edible. They're, they're full of sap, white sap. But the tree makes a fast growing tree. It has thorns. It was used as a living fence. Some of the oldest trees in Mecklenburg County are Osage orange. At least they were. Many have been destroyed. And there's, there's, there's few left. And there's, there's some old ones at historic Rosedale, over 200 years old. These trees have staying power. And so they were one of the first. Here again, the frontier kept moving to the west. And so this was one of the great new things that Lewis Clark sent back to Thomas Jefferson. By 1810, tensions had turned even further and Japan became the new botanical frontier. Japan had been discovered. So all the botanists and explorers were rushing to Japan, uh, kind of to do what they did in, in, in Eastern North America, see what they could find. And so uh, many of our new plants in the early uh, 1800s that are grown in gardens today came from uh, Japan, uh, Japanese maples especially, but uh, camellias and hollies, and boxwoods, and many other plants that we take for granted now originally came from Japan and they grow well here because our climate is very similar to, to Japan. So in summary, the Carolinas have long been a place of unique beauty and easy living. <laughs> Uh, long growing season, mild climate. These folks may not have spent the summer here without humidity. Maybe it wasn't so bad back then. Uh, early on, it was famous for its crops, its herbs, its native uh, people, the unique plants, uh, especially medicinal plants. It, it was a, you know, uh, the Carolinas were played a pivotal role in the early days because of Charleston being important uh, uh, port and many botanists uh, living in South Carolina. And folks came over back then as they do today. 
uh, looking for interesting plants, botanists, horticulturists, hobbyists, explorers, looking for famous plants. So I want you all to be proud of the Carolinas and its botanical heritage as having been a center, a focal point really of early days of discoveries, uh, of useful things and unusual, um, uh, unusual plants. If you're interested in these sorts of things, there's some great little books. There's a little book that uh, mentions all, uh, all of the people and all the plants, even more uh, colonial days, uh, plants of colonial days by Raymond Taylor. Uh, this is a little book produced by Colonial Williamsburg. Our own uh, Kay Moss, their Southern Folk Medicine, it has a very nice uh, book that tells about the way things were used in the late colonial period. And then a uh, fairly new Moss and Suzanne Simmons, uh, a wonderful book, A Curious Garden of Herbs, where they talk about herbal uses, especially for medicinal purposes that, that were grown in gardens. It's not so much wild plants, although some, but mostly garden plants. And then we just discovered this book, The Lost Book of Herbal Remedies by Nicole Appleyan. It's a fabulous book on uh, great pictures of of, of, of herbal uses of plants from the earliest days and recipes. And, and recipes. They both have recipes. And if you, if you don't like the old, I know you'd like the old, but if you want to move into the modern, these two new books on native plants of the Southeast, uh, uh, written, co-authored by myself and Paula Gross, uh, you, you might like these sorts of books to look through to see this is where these early plants were used as garden plants. Uh, I don't, I probably don't mention a single herbal use uh, in, in writing these books, but all about their ornamental beauty as native plants for the garden. So that's the end. Are there any questions? <laughs> Valerie, you may have to field questions or you can just turn everybody on and let them, let them okay. come. Oh, who's your little friend? <laughs> or Jane or whoever's, I don't know, he's a dog off the internet. He's raising his hand. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if you don't have any questions, you can raise your hands now. Well, Larry, I had no idea the big leaf magnolia, that that leaf was so big. I, yeah, I just had no they're, idea. They're huge. Amazing, oh, amazing. I had one quick question for you. Okay. Um, the pitcher plant. Is there any connection to the what we call the jack in the pulpit? Because that kind of looks no. That to is it. a that is a hundred percent common misconception. When I uh, talk to people about okay. plants, and they say, "Oh, I have those in my backyard." When we go out and look. It's always jack in the pulpit. the The jack in the pulpit structure that you might call a pitcher is actually uh, the flowering structure. And in the true pitcher plants, it's strictly the leaf structure. Uh, flowers uh, don't really eat insects, uh, uh, and they grow in uh, woodland woodland sites. The true uh, pitcher plants grow in open, sunny, wet bogs down the coast, and they uh, catch and digest insects. They're not related at all, but they might look superficially similar. So did they come from somewhere else? The no pitcher plants are native. Pitcher, all of the 11 known pitcher plants are native here in the Southeast. And the Venus flytrap, native only to North Carolina. And so uh, they're unique to the Southeast. The pitcher plants uh, were not known in the colonial period, uh, particularly as carnivorous plants, as I mentioned. It wasn't until the uh, Victorian era of the late 1800s, the pitcher plants became all the rage uh, back in England, and many, many pitcher plants were imported from, from North America and grown and made into garden plants uh, during that period uh, as ornamentals. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they come only from North America, southeastern North America. Any other questions? So I know there's a lot of, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Anybody else have questions? Uh, many, there, are many other, there are many other native plants. This is just a wonderful program. Most famous ones.
All right, well, I enjoyed speaking to you ladies and uh, uh, we'll see you again in person someday, I hope. Or I can take you on a tour of the UNCC gardens and show you some of these wild plants in person. But we have almost, we have everything I've mentioned uh, you know, growing out there uh, in, in a oh, real city. That would be wonderful. So I'm gonna try to log off here. Well, thank you, Larry. That sounds like it'd be a wonderful uh, trip for us to take. Sure. All right, here I go.